Hello and welcome to The View from 22, a spectator show where we like to look at a story that isn't necessarily dominating the news. But this week we thought we'd do the exact opposite because there is only one story that has dominated the globe so far. And that, of course, is the indictment of President Donald J. Trump. I'm delighted to be joined by Alan Dershowitz, who is a very distinguished lawyer and the author of Get Trump, The Threat to Civil Liberties, Due Process and Our Constitutional Rule of Law. And we're also joined by Charles Lipson, who is a professor of political science and a much-loved spectator contributor. Now, Alan, uh, you, as the author of Get Trump, uh, are well aware of the fact that there has been seven years, eight years maybe, of attempts to uh, get Trump legally through various different trials and and prosecutions. Um, But it finally happened yesterday, last night. And I think it's fair to say the sort of mood, even among the people who hate Trump the most, was a bit muted. Uh, Is there a sort of widespread feeling that this case is thin and that even people who hate Donald Trump accept that it's thin? Well, I was hoping there'd be a strong indictment. I'm not a Trump supporter. I voted against him, and it would vindicate the American legal system and the New York criminal justice system. But uh, the DA has labored and has produced a mouse, uh, and uh, it's an extremely weak indictment. The basic theory behind the indictment is that once Trump paid $130,000 in hush money to prevent his family, his wife, his business partners from learning about an alleged adulterous affair, he should immediately have then made it public in his corporate forms. Uh, No one in the history of the world has ever done that, and yet the district attorney really expected that of him. We've had thousands of hush payments made, starting with Alexander Hamilton early in our history, uh, and up through uh, current uh, corporate leaders. Nobody in history has ever then disclosed it on a corporate form. And that yet that lies at the center of this, um, this frivolous indictment against him. Remember, the man who indicted him ran for office on the ground that, look, I'm a Democrat. I promise to get Trump. I'll stop him from running for office. And then uh, he decided to get Trump uh, and rummaged through all the statute books, found nothing and then just made up. A, a technical crime that doesn't really exist. Well, yeah, I, I read the indictment and I don't have a legal mind, but it looked unbelievably thin, particularly since I've been speaking to some people who were sort of get Trump types uh, and they were hopeful, possibly even some of them convinced that there would be something in these 34 counts that was new and explosive. Yeah. But it just yeah. wasn't there, was it? It's not there. And uh, no matter how you stretch it, no matter how many counts you put down, it's essentially the same thing. The expectation that if you've paid hush money, you're there going to put the reason, the actual reason on your corporate form. Uh, And then he extrapolates that into the reason he really entered the form fraudulently was to help his campaign had nothing to do with his wife or his family or his business. It's such a stretch. In 60 years of uh, litigating and teaching criminal cases, I've never seen a thinner indictment than this or one that was so based on who the person is rather than what the crime was. You know, there were crimes committed. Uh, probably Stormy Daniels extorted him uh, by threatening to expose it in exchange for money. Uh, The 34 counts, the fact that there were 34 counts leaked, the only people who could have leaked that would be people in Bragg's office or people in the grand jury. That's a more serious felony than anything he charged Trump with. So we're seeing selective targeted injustice here. And it's a very, very bad day Mm. for America. And we'll talk about the bad day for America in a second. But just quickly, uh, the motion, a motion to dismiss would be the next obvious uh, move, would it not? And it fail. should be. Safe. That will fail. That will fail because no judge will want to be the one who people can point their finger to and say, he's the judge who freed Donald Trump. Look, I defended Donald Trump once on the floor of the Senate and it destroyed years and years of friendships, business associations, ability to write for newspapers. I was completely canceled just for def- defending Trump on constitutional grounds in front of the Senate. Imagine how much worse it would be for a judge, an elected judge. Remember, we elect our judges, an elected judge to run on the 
claim that he's the one who freed Donald Trump in the borough of Manhattan. So I think that motion will fail. The motions that have a chance of succeeding are the change of venue to a different area of New York or the statute of limitations, which seems like a very strong motion. But these motions may not work in front of the judge. They may have to wait until after the case is over and the appeal is conducted. By that time, we'll be right in the middle of the 2024 election campaign. So this really does interfere with an election. And when you do that and you're a Democrat and you're trying to defeat a Republican, you better have the strongest possible case. This is not a strong case. It's a very, very And we should case. say you are a, a lifelong Democrat who did not yes. vote for Donald Trump yes. in 2016. Is that right? Uh, right. Although That's I think right. Trump likes to say that you only say that to, to, to get more credibility. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but true. It's true. Uh, uh, Charles, the future of America. A lot of, a lot of despair yesterday about America and uh, you know, what this means for democracy and so on. Do you share that sense of dread? Okay. Um, if you live in Chicago, you share it for a second reason. We just elected a far left mayor who's a union organizer for the teachers union. But <clears throat> of course, the far bigger issue for the country is what has happened to uh, uh, the indictment of Donald Trump. I too am no Trump supporter. And I think there are strong cases against Donald Trump, uh, especially the issue related to Mar-a-Lago, which is n not just that he kept documents, which it appears he had no right to keep, but that he made a formal declaration that he did not have any more documents when he not only had them, but must have known that he had them because some were in his desk. The issue in uh, a second indictment that is likely to come uh, is in Georgia whether uh, he attempted illegally uh, to uh, ask state uh, lawmakers in charge of uh, the vote count in 2020 to find him votes that really weren't there. Now, he will def say that he meant find votes that had somehow been suppressed and that he was only seeking uh, legal of votes, but uh, that's a, and, and so that's a more complex case. But uh, I think <clears throat> what happened last night in America, which is that Donald Trump went and uh, did what he so often does, which is he personalized the issue. He attacked not only the judge and the prosecutor, but their families by name. Uh, these kinds of things are just outrageous. And <clears throat> at some point, you have to fear um, either that there could be violence directed at those people or uh, that the American voting public, especially the Republican voters who would vote in a primary, just decide we've had enough of this. So far, they've decided to rally round um Donald Trump, that's a kind of rally around the flag effect. The, the real question there is how long that will last. Mm. Well, we've had quite a lot of warnings of, uh, you know, violence uh, in the last few days. And of course, everybody will think back to January the 6th. And uh, that, that's, that's obviously quite a, a, a grave concern. But uh, last night, there was an enormous police presence. Uh, there was no um, significant uh, violence, uh, and there was no real threat of significant violence. Isn't this a slight kind of democratic fantasy that uh, Trump is, is, you know, fermenting violence everywhere he goes? Well, to some extent, you're, uh, I agree with that, uh, with what you're saying, uh, Freddie, but there's another aspect to it, which is, uh, first of all, we're taking more and more of our political issues and moving them into the legal setting, the legal context. They're being decided uh, in the courts and worse, they're being decided by uh, bureaucracies, law enforcement bureaucracies like the FBI uh, and um, some that shouldn't be involved in domestic politics like the CIA. 
and, and so forth. That's a problem. But I think the equally important problem is that people are uh, in the United States, and I know this has happened in Britain and it's happened in continental Europe as well, have lost a, a lot of their trust in governmental institutions and in other institutions like the media. Um, uh, the only institution in the United States that has more than 50% approval is the U.S. military. Every other institution ha is not just underwater. Th there are no bubbles coming up from underwater. <laughs> that's how far underwater they are. And that's a grave thing. And what you have time and again from Donald Trump is sort of a frontal assault on many of these institutions, not on policy grounds, not on the grounds that um, they have uh, accrued to themselves more power than they should legitimately have, but on very fundamental grounds. They're against us and all, all, all the rest. I've got to say, I completely agree with Alan Dershowitz on this uh, particular indictment in New York. The, the biggest problem that he is underscoring, in my opinion, is not just that the indictment is thin, but that it is bass backwards, as we say. It began with a person, and then they found the crime. That's never supposed to happen in the Anglo-American system of justice or any Western system of justice. This is not just a relentless prosecutor, but in New York, the two leading prosecutors on the state level, Letitia James, the attorney general, and the Manhattan prosecutor, Alvin Bragg, campaigned on the grounds that they were going to get this particular person. And then they found they have worked to find something to get him. Well, th sure. that's, a, that's a very good point. And Alan, I wanted to ask you about that because, I mean, as a Brit, as an outsider, we look at the American justice system and it does strike us at odd that you have uh, elected judges, that you have uh, the justice system is so democratized. Um, and I suppose what strikes me is that it's, it's more uh, extraordinary that this hasn't happened more and more often. Um, that the that the judicial process is so flagrantly political. Mm -hmm. Well, it has. It has happened. It happened since the days of Andrew Jackson. Remember, the United States was established not as a democracy. The word democracy never appears in any of the original documents. It became a democracy under what's called Jacksonian democracy, and they went crazy. They elect judges, elect prosecutors. You know, in Florida, you elect the public defender. Can you imagine the campaign? Candidate A, I took Dershowitz's classes. He taught me everything. If you elect me, I'll free every murderer, rapist, and robber. Candidate B, I failed out of law school. I'm a terrible lawyer. If you elect me, all the bad guys will go to jail. You don't elect public defenders, and you don't elect judges, and you don't elect prosecutors if you want justice. The British system is far, far better where you have career prosecutors, where you have a director of public prosecution, it's a much more credible and it's much more sound. We should borrow the British system of justice, uh, much like Britain has borrowed some of our systems. But we impose the wrong system. You cannot have democracy in a court of law. It's not what the people want. In communist countries, democracy. I went to a Chinese trial, and once the evidence was in, they opened the doors, and they had the masses come in and say, guilty, guilty, guilty. That's democracy. Uh, Alan, but that's Alan when I was it's growing true. up, uh, the local justices of the peace were paid only if they convicted you. That's right. And there was a Supreme I've got to tell you <laughs> that your chances of being found not guilty or, as uh, Nancy Pelosi would so eloquently put it, proving your innocence. Good Lord. It, th those chances approached zero. Yeah, no, but you know, the American system of justice can often be quite fair, but with Trump derangement syndrome um, and people, half the country, determined to see Donald Trump in prison, you're not going to get a fair trial. And if 87% of the people of the borough of Manhattan want to see him in prison, you're just not going to get a fair trial. It took a Supreme Court decision 
to actually rule unconstitutional these rules where people got paid by how many convictions they got. It was part of our system. For hey, I, it years. happened to me. I, I hope- can tell you that. Uh-huh. I had a justice of the peace. I was on my way to a concert in Memphis, a rock and roll concert. And uh, I was with a bunch of friends. And I had the justice of the peace actually have all of us in the car take out our wallets, see how much money we all had. And then we had to negotiate with him to leave us enough money to pay for the parking in Memphis. Yeah, I had a similar situation when I was a civil rights worker down in the South. Uh, our car was stopped and uh, we were taken in and and had to pay whatever we had in our pocket. For no the kidding. Oh, uh, I didn't realize yeah, we, had, we, had, we had this had the in same, common. The same, the same, very same situation. But, you know, I would hope that uh, the indictment of Trump may may mark a change. I think a lot of Americans, Democrats, liberals, uh, people who don't like Trump like me, uh, who don't vote for Trump like me, may be having an epiphany, may be saying too much is too much. And maybe we'll learn a lesson from this and maybe we can help turn it around. I'm the eternal optimist. I hope it will happen. But I am confident that Trump cannot get a fair trial in Manhattan. And that has to be the first step we take to avoid multiplying the injustice of the kind we've already seen. I think, Adam, am I right in saying there's a New York expression, if you're not indicted, you're not invited? Have you? (laughs) Well, you know, there are a lot of New York expressions. uh, And there's one that if you think you can get a fair trial in New York for Donald Trump, I have a bridge to Brooklyn (laughs) that I'll sell you. Uh, there, there, there is no possibility of that happening. And my friends who are liberals and Democrats agree with that. They just want to see him convicted. I had somebody who said to me, I know it will destroy the Constitution, but it's worth it because preventing Donald Trump from becoming president is more important than preserving the Constitution. In my book, Get Trump, I actually quote people making those kinds of statements that Donald Trump is like Adolf Hitler. And you can do and should do anything to stop him from becoming president. That's a mindset that is inconsistent. And with it justice. has it has become much more pervasive, not just around Trump, but around a lot of issues. I would say one of the most fundamental changes in American politics in the past several decades has been that it has become much more ideological along European lines, Freddie. Um, yes. Uh, our politics used to be a lot of meat in the center. It was mediated by uh, political institutions and so forth, like big city political machines and, and so forth. You can say many things negative about them, but they had um, they were not ideological operations. They were patronage operations. They were give jobs to your friends in the African-American community or Irish-American community or whatever. Uh, But we are now much more similar to a kind of labor versus Tory or left-right European social democracy versus uh, Christian Democrats. But and there are fights, deep fights, within both parties around these issues. I'll say one more thing about Trump. Trump fundamentally changed the Republican Party. And that's not just about his personality. The Republican Party used to be the party of big business. Big business is now firmly in support of the Democrats on everything except taxing big business. But... Um, the um, what Trump did was shifted the politics of the Republican Party toward a working class base. And the Democrats are, I would say, split. Uh, and the Republicans are split on, in their own way. But the Democrats are now split. And I would say the two people that people observers tend to put on the same side uh, they tend to say well uh, on the left are people like elizabeth warren and bernie sanders but to me and, and in many issues they are but to me the difference is that bernie sanders is fundamentally a left-wing populist 
And Elizabeth Warren is fundamentally a regulatory state left winger. And uh, you see this kind of split between the AOC wing of the party and the Nancy Pelosi type wing, and they try to bridge it. And on the Republican side, you see it between the firebrands on the right, who are essentially populists, and the Mitch McConnells, who are essentially uh, center-right, much more uh, 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 aligned with the corporatist wing of the party. So I, I think that Trump brings out, and Trump has done fundamental things to change the nature of American politics. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of speculation, obviously, that um, the Democrats uh, want Trump to be in the frame, and that's part of the this conspiracy to, to get him, is that they know that it helps him in the polls, and they know that it makes him the, the candidate they're most likely to face. And that's ultimately what the people around Joe Biden want, because they think they can beat him. Do you believe that? Look, Biden is a very, very weak candidate. And uh, a strong Republican candidate uh, would be likely to beat him under current circumstances. Uh, but Trump is actually a very weak candidate in the general election. And the reason for that is not only that young voters uh, are staunchly opposed to him in overwhelming numbers, but so are many educated and upper income voters and even just middle income voters who live in the suburbs and so forth. I think the the longer term impact of all these indictments which are likely to come is uh, that people will simply associate Trump with more and more tumult. And Trump is himself so undisciplined that um, that all of his campaign right now is about revenge. People don't elect uh, leaders for the next four years to exact revenge. And if they did, it would be a terrible thing uh, for a democracy. They elect people to solve problems like inflation, uh, like uh, rising interest rates, like um, what are we going to do about China? What are we going to do about uh, support for Ukraine? Big looming issues. We have failing education system in virtually all big cities. We have uh, a kind of permanent underclass of the poor now. And how are we going to deal with them? Uh, some cities are just letting them camp out on the streets. All of these are big problems. And uh, uh, the country wants solutions to them. One of Trump's problems going forward is that on a lot of the issues he promised to deliver on, he didn't. He did deliver on some big issues, including immigration. But I think that this sort of backward-looking revenge and the tumult that's constantly around him will lead uh, over time to people going back to a president who was elected a century ago, not a good president, Warren G. Harding, uh, who, after uh, Woodrow Wilson, promised a return to normalcy. And there's going to be a lot of people who would like to see that. Well, but Joe Biden promised a bit of that, and I'm not sure we've had it. But, uh, uh, Charles, we better end it there. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and thank you very much, Alan, too. Um, uh, that's it for uh, The View from 22. Um, please tune in again next time. Thank you.